Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Thanks for coming back. Um, my name is Qing Yun Li. I'm a fourth year PhD student. I will graduate in the fall next semester. My research is looking at the diet composition, especially fiber and carbohydrates, and the gut health and performance in nursery pigs. Me, myself, and my colleague Spencer Becker will be the session chairs for this session in this afternoon. And I'll let her introduce herself. Well, welcome everybody and good afternoon. Um, we're in concurrent session two, decision making and farm management. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker for this afternoon, Mr. Dave Delaney. Dave is the director of marketing at Kearns and Associates. In this role, Dave leverages his 30 years of industry experience to assist clients in developing, negotiating, and managing successful marketing programs. This afternoon, he'll be discussing negotiating hogs then, now, and into the future. Welcome, Dave. Good afternoon. Thank you, Lee, and thank you, Spencer. The reason I say Lee is I cannot pronounce your first name. Q. 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 There we go. Uh, welcome, everybody. I am humbled and honored that you are all in this session because I believe I'm the only one without a DR in front of my name. So thank you for showing up. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, negotiating hogs. Uh, we're going to go back a few years, back into the 80s. We're going to talk about from the 80s to current times, and then what we feel negotiating hogs is going to look like into the future. Um, certainly want you all uh, not to wait to the end. I, liked, I know this is a formal setting, but we can certainly have uh, questions fired at me during, just stop me and raise your hand and we'll go ahead and answer them. So, um, most of you were here this morning and you saw Dr. Meyer uh, speak. Dr. Meyer and I uh, work together, colleagues for Kearns and Associates. Uh, Dr. Meyer talked about the disclaimer. I have two. This one is the same as Dr. Meyer, so please don't take any of my advice today and trade on it. If you're wrong, that's your fault, not mine. The second disclaimer I have is I get to work with very intelligent people every day. Uh, I do not claim to have the speaking ability or experience of either one of those two. Uh, Joe Kearns on the left, who is my boss, and Dr. Meyer, who I just noticed that picture came off our website, but I think that's the same tie he was wearing today, so I'm going to have to buy him one for Christmas. Um, then, now, and into the future. So we're going to explore uh, negotiating, pricing sources, scenarios, trends. We're going to talk about some producer demographics. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of negotiating hogs not just negotiating, but every day. We're going to talk about changing a price discovery and then discuss forward thoughts, scope, and, and uh, scale of spot marketing. So David McDonald from OSI talked a little bit about going back to memory lane. Um, I grew up, my dad drank Ham's beer. My grandma uh, smoked Lucky Strike cigarettes with no filters and drank Falstaff. So I remember those days. Uh, so back in the 80s, and, and the reason I'm going back that far is that's when I started in the industry, 1986, I started working for a company called Heinhold Hog Market. That was uh, uh, kind of in this uh, first section of trading where you could go uh, on a cash basis, you could trade. Uh, there's buying stations all over the country, all over the Midwest, down south. Heinhold had markets in Kentucky, Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Nebraska, I believe a few in Minnesota. Um, you had terminal markets. You heard Dr. Meyer talk today about terminal markets that were really centered around uh, and near to small packing facilities. Um, back then, St. Joe, Peoria, Chicago, Kansas City, uh, you had daily markets that came out on the radio. That's virtually how you knew what was going on in the market. Um, Today, I think the Brownfield Network might, does anybody listen to the Brownfield Network or do they still, I think they still uh, publish uh, prices. Um, so back then, uh, there was lots of opportunity to sell hogs. A lot of them were negotiated. 
uh, in the country markets. Small towns, you might have two or three companies, Oscar Mayer, IBP back then, uh, Ruth, that they, they may have a buying station in the same town or two miles outside of town. So there was lots of opportunities for you to market your pigs. You could call three buyers in 15 minutes, get three bids, boom, you sold your hog to the highest bidder. Um, back then, grade and yield standards in the 80s were, uh, were really, you know, most of the pigs were bought live. Um, we're gonna talk about how, how our industry uh, moved from many negotiated hogs to where we're at today, which is fewer, and I think part of the grade and yield situation helped escalate less and less uh, cash negotiated hogs because of A, the consumer wanted leaner pork, and B, the, the packing industry wanted to get those tied up. Um, commission buyers were popular not only in the hog market, but in all species, lamb, beef. Uh, if, you, if you went through a commission firm, you had a person that uh, you had built a relationship with. Uh, back then, you would pay commission fees. You had to pay freight to the terminal where you were going. Um, you had a lot of cost uh, comparative today when most of our hogs go directly to the packing plant. Um, back then, we didn't have direct to the plant because really two reasons. Uh, the packers had longstanding relationships with commission firms, order buyers, people that made a living supplying pigs to the packer every day. Um, back then, again, as I had mentioned earlier, there, there was a hog buying station on each corner uh, of a little town. So plenty of opportunities to go to. Um, talking about uh, uh, spot market today versus this is back in 2003, uh, May of 2003, May of this year. We look at the constant, the consistency of our, our cash market uh, seasonally. Uh, you know, we can see the seasonality here, uh, but not as many ups and downs, less volatility. We didn't, uh, we didn't have our administration uh, back in 03 tweeting. Um, the volatility certainly today is, is, is higher and greater than it was back then. Um, we're going to talk about pricing trends from, uh, from a spot negotiation standpoint. Um, the hog back in the 80s, uh, when I started, uh, was different than the hog today. Y you heard David talk about quality. Back then, we had a large range of, of quality of pigs that we sold. We had a large range of genetic companies that were out selling genetics to our producers. Uh, Farmer's Hybrid was very popular back then. Today, that is not what the consumer wants, right? Uh, we went to a leaner, bigger product, bigger hogs. Back in the 1980s, uh, top weight hogs were in the 240, 250 range. Um, prior to that, uh, I remember uh, back when I started talking to a gentleman that trained me that told me when he started, top weight range in butchers was 190 to 210, a 20-pound spread. He started back in the 60s. So we have evolved um, today to a much larger carcass. Um, Packers position uh, to, to secure quality hogs. I would mentioned that earlier. Um, how many think that our spot market decreased because of 1998 and the crash of the hog market? Generally speaking, you talk to people and they say, yeah, after 98, that really changed the industry. Uh, you know, the buzzword was uh, you needed to get uh, aligned somehow with the packer being pushed by the lenders. Really, we saw that, and I'll show you a slide here in a minute. We saw that transition of our spot market, our negotiated market, shrinking in the early 90s. And it was all due and driven by consumers. They wanted better quality meat, right? Consumers trigger the packer, trigger the producer. Um, so I remember when I worked for farmland, Sheldon Farwell was the head buyer. I had the ability to, to go to Dubuque, Iowa a time or two and fill in for him. And uh, he told me, he said, Dave, I will never, ever get mad at you for buying good quality hogs. I will get mad at you for paying too much money for bad hogs. So that was the start of the trend. Um, 
that we saw that packers wanted to align, so we saw more agreements come in um, with producers that had consistent quality genetics that were fed properly to meet the needs of what the consumer demand was. Um, producers shift to after 98 really to, to managing risk, right? They, uh, they wanted to secure, secure shackles. Uh, 98, uh, if you looked on Dr. Meyer's slide today, was, was uh, uh, a bad year because we did. We just, we ran out of shackle spaces. We had too many hogs. I remember sitting in a buying station in DeWitt, Iowa for Farmland Foods and uh, people would call and say, can I bring you hogs next week? I said, I can't take them for four weeks. I had one death threat back then. It was real, guys. It was sad. Um, at that point in time, I, I don't know if the market would have went to zero, but Farmland stepped in and said, hey, we're not going to pay less than eight cents. And I thought, oh, wow, Whew. maybe no more death threats. I don't know. But uh, yeah, at the end of the day, that really woke people up to say, hey, maybe I do need to get a line. Maybe I do need to have some type of agreement or formalization with a packing company. So that I have a space, a shackle to send my pig to because I don't want to run out of that again. Um, so we talk about different types. Um, there was a lot of floors that were put in place at that point in time. Um, floors with uh, a cost of production wrapped around them. Um, there was cost of production agreements with ledgers. Formula pricing came in at that point in time. And then certainly the ability to forward price on a forward curve look on the CME. Also in 06, uh, right, ethanol came in, um, wasn't quite as bad as eight cent hogs, but our input costs increased. So overwhelmingly, and you'll see that on the chart that I show, the COPs, the floors with matrices that were based around corn and soy input costs got more popular and popular again. Um, so this chart was put together, actually that's another thing working with uh, Joe Kearns and, and Dr. Steve Meyer is ask them a question about history or a chart or, or an example and they probably have it. Not, they don't probably have it, they do. They may have two or three. Um, Dr. Meyer gave me this and, and I just wanted to show you and, and depict here how we changed um, the spot market um, from the 90s uh, to current time. So. Uh, the reason that this is blank here in 94 is uh, uh, Ron Plain and Glenn Grimes were creating the numbers for this and all they focused on in 94 was the spot market. Later it became, uh, uh, they, they do dove in and, and got more of this information so that they re could record and, and move forward. So back in 1994 we were 62% in the spot market. Today we're three. Whoops, we're 3.2 percent. Um, that's from 2018, January 1st till. I think Cody did it last week for me. Um, so what that is, taking that number, how we arrived to that number is we take the negotiated hogs off of the 201 report, which is right here, and we divide it by the total uh, total hogs. So you take that number and come up with total negotiated. And this is, um, again, off the 201, but it's the producer sold hogs. Um, looking at 97, uh, we dropped, that was our biggest drop from 62 to 43, 19% we dropped in three years. 97 to 99, we dropped, uh, what is that, roughly uh, 35, about 8%. Uh, then we go down 10. Co coincidentally, we end up 3.2%. We are a very, very tr thinly traded market um, from a transparency standpoint. Um, reason I came to work for Joe and Karen Kearns back in August of 2015 is the customer base that they work with said, hey, our industry is too thinly traded on the cash. We want to do something about that. We want to do our part. So that's what I do today. Uh, my main job there. I'm, try I'm in the market every day, um, certainly try to, uh, to sell hogs every day, and that way uh, we feel we have a pretty good understanding. As we look at uh, the rest of this, keep hitting the wrong button, you have uh, your mercantile exchange, uh, your forward pricing. These four really, 
your ledger that have ledger behind them, uh, whether it's a ledger or a non-ledger cost production window. Those are really um, bundled up together and, and they would fall in your other purchase agreements here on, off of your 201. Um, your mercantiles, your, your CMEs would fall right in here. And then your formula hogs, of course, on the top would fall right in here. Uh, recently, uh, we have added a new column to uh, the 201, and it's the negotiated formula column right over here. And that's nothing more than really what it means. It means that I call a packer today, I'm going to sell hogs next, next week, and we negotiate a formula off of a USDA market, whether it's an Iowa Southern Minnesota market, cut out, whatever. Um, we very rarely, due to the reporting guidelines, we very rarely see a price print in that area because of confidentiality. Um, so that is not a, a real popular way to sell hogs. Um, matter of fact, we stuck that in here on the other um, in the 2018 column. So uh, right now there's about a half a percent that, that sell uh, that way from January 1st till, till current in 2018. Hey, yes, sir. Sure, and uh, good question, Mike. I don't know all the rules I used to, but uh, there has to be more than a couple packers report uh, on a given market. There can't be one packer that has more than, and help me out, you may know the 70%, 60 to 70. Jack's in here, do you know Jack? 70, uh, yeah. So there's some parameters around that from a confidentiality standpoint. Um, mandatory price reporting came in after 98. You heard Dr. Meyer talk about it today. Uh, came in effect in 1999. And, uh, you know, it, has it worked? I, I, I do believe it has. Um, are, are we a thinly traded market and is transparency uh, very clear? You know, that's questionable. I'm going to show you an, an example. Um, we're going to go back to as recent as this March, this spring, and show you an example of what can happen if we don't market enough hogs. Um, we're going to look about some demographics. Uh, not only as we shrank the spot market, um, we have, you know, shrank the industry as far as number of producers. We talked back uh, in the 80s that, you know, I remember taking a lot of hogs in pickup loads, 10, 8, 10 head, 12 head. 45 was big. Um, I worked in uh, Birmingham, Iowa in 1987. In one day, the biggest day I ever had in that buying station, I bought 750 head from a guy that was between me and the Missouri line, about four miles away. That's the biggest, and it took them all day with trailers, goosenecks, pickups, and straight trucks to get those hogs in. How times have changed. Look at the, uh, the attrition rates here. From 50 to 65, we had a 2% decrease our loss in producers. Uh, whoops. Look at that. 99, after 98 to 2002, we lost 31%. It continues to consolidate. We're not only consolidating in the producer community, we're consolidating in genetics, nutrition, packing. Now, the packing industry has turned around and, and we have more interest and more growth there, which is a good thing if you're a hog producer, right? We never want to run out of shackle space. So. Here's the number of, of hog operations, and uh, so this one came from Joe. Dr. Meyer showed one earlier. I, I guess I didn't ask him for this one. I think his went back to 88, and his showed like 450,000 pork operations. Uh, so six-year difference, we had you know, about 100,000 decrease. But look at that line and how quickly it goes. Uh, again, here's 98. We had a rapid decline since then. Uh, Though we have consolidated, I think, the, the ones that are in it today um, certainly have built very credible businesses and certainly want to be sustainable and continue. Another uh, demograph, yes? Actually, the 31% is a little misleading because when you look at it, it, it it's, a, it's a bigger percentage, but your denominator is much smaller. It's smaller, correct. So when you look at those numbers, they're, the, the decline has been kind of regular. Correct. Correct. Very good point, Howard. Yes. Yep. Uh, operations, again, like I said, we, the, the people we work with today, um, they're 
one of their major concerns is sustainability, onboarding, and succession planning of their current business that they've built up. So um, that is something that we current, you know, we commonly have discussions uh, with our with our clientele about. Here's another demographic. You look at 95, 05, 2015. These are pork powerhouses that that everybody sees. They're published by Successful Farming. Um, just wanted to make note, let's not focus so much on top, but on the bottom. Uh, number 20 back in 1995 was 16,000 sows. Doubled 10 years later, and another 10 years, 48,500. Things have changed, right? Things have cons consolidated and continue to do so. Uh, Again, negotiating hogs, we feel, is crucial uh, for a transparent market in the industry. Um, I'm not telling you that if you, and, and I'm not saying the answer is size of scale, whether you negotiate or not, but uh, we know that today, uh, 2 to 3 percent of the pigs price the other 97 to 98. I showed you in that graph, we're about 3 percent uh, in the spot. So. If you are a small producer and you have 100% of your hogs tied up, and, and let's say you market two loads a week, I'm not telling you you need to negotiate one and then sell the other one on your formula. I think size and scale comes into effect here. Um, I think if you, uh, you certainly market hogs every day on a formula or some type of agreement, uh, that you do need to be negotiating in, in the spot market. Um, why is it important? Here's an example. If you are a pork producer and you have hogs on, that are based on a USDA quoted market such as the Iowa Southern Minnesota formula. Say you have the ISM plus a number. You go to your packer partner five days a week. You sell X amount of loads every day. I'm going to show you what happened and the importance of affecting the Iowa Southern Minnesota to protect your pricing structure that you have in place. This was back in March, March 8th of this year was a Thursday. The weighted average price on that Thursday in the afternoon was 62.57. We traded 5,033 hogs in that market. The very next day was March 9th. The price for the Iowa Southern Minnesota weighted average was 59.72. 1,455 head traded, that's it. That's $2.85 a hundred difference. That's a big drop. Did that need to happen? Probably not. Can it go the other way? Yeah, it can. If you have five loads at 62.57 that you got from your packer partner the day prior, you wake up on Friday morning you're going to get 59.72. You can see the total dollars. That's about a thousand dollars per load, less one to the next. Pretty big. Regional packers today, you know, we we talk about the three percent. I, I hear from producers, well, I can't sell negotiated hogs every day. The packers won't buy them. They don't want to buy them. They're all tied up. That's not true. There's regional packers today, and I talk to them every day. And I understand geographics comes into play, but there's people out there today that will buy negotiated hogs every day of the week. Right? It's no big secret, guys. The packers are highly committed because they can forecast pricing. Right? They know what they've got coming to some extent. They can forecast it. They have a consumer retail customer, wholesale customer, food service customer on the other end that gets a quality consistent product, right? So do they want to negotiate hogs? Yeah, they do. Packers want to. Why? If you have 98% of them tied up, how can you lower your cost? You have to get in the open market and negotiate them, right? It's no trade secret, right? They want to give you the least amount for your hogs and keep you happy and you want to get the most amount for your hogs and keep your packer relationship going. So right, it's not a trade secret. Um, negotiating really truly today is a lost art. It is um, for many reasons. 
time, inexperience, knowledge, and, and just sheer, right? We haven't done it for so long. I left Cargill back in uh, 2015 to come to work for Joe and Karen. And, and prior to that, I managed um, a section of our buyers out in the field. We were never in the open market. We weren't. We were highly leveraged. We were highly committed. We were overcommitted at times that, that scared the heck out of us. Um, we didn't buy hogs. So we were one of those packers when I was with Cargill, who now is JBS, so uh, I can talk about that. But we didn't buy it. Our buyers didn't have the sense or the art of no negotiating hogs. Young buyers that we brought in really didn't get a chance to understand how it went, how true negotiation went. Their job was to A, sign up supply, B, maintain relationships, right? And C, uh, continue to, uh, to uh, uh, maintain and work, work on new and existing relationships. So um, I, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Nashville here about a month ago, six weeks ago, uh, to listen to uh, a lot of speakers at the PIC symposium. One of the speakers was JT De Dean from Versova, who uh, they are, I believe, the third largest egg producer in the United States. He said something that resonated to me. He said he was actually talking about welfare, um, what they've been through in their industry with the cages and all of that. But he said something up there that resonated with me, and it was, a, it was about pricing. He said, price discovery, discovery neutralized the egg industry. And when that happened, it created more volatility. And I've got to show you this. And I'm going to give kudos to this young man because he helped me create this presentation. Cody Good, stand up. Watch the, watch the egg, guys. That really shows you true volatility. So, uh, but it, you know, it, 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 it's, so again, at the end of the day, it's very, very, very important. That, that we look at the negotiation of hogs, that we learn how to do it, and that we continue to do it. Um, right now, today, who has control of the pork? Right? We produce it as producers, but the packers have control. They're 98%, 97 to 98% committed, right? Uh, why would you let someone else determine your fate of that 2 to 3% that get negotiated every day. If you have an ISM agreement or any type of USDA agreement, why, why would you go ahead and say, okay, Packer Partner, you're going to take them all at this, you know, at this formula, this agreement, and then you just sit back. You don't care what the ISM does. Yeah, you do care, right? Be a part of it. Help yourself. It's easy to negotiate hogs when the market's going up. I think it's more important to protect and preserve that price when the market's going down if I'm a producer. So uh, act, activity in the market builds knowledge. Again, uh, there's lots of resources out there, folks, that uh, you can reach out to. You can call our office. We, we do it every day. Um, there's many resources out there that market hogs every day. Um, uh, so reach out and use it. Um, jumped ahead of myself. Uh, we're, we really firmly believe that if we educate the industry, continue to educate the industry, have packers come on that are willing to buy open market pigs, um, we believe that in the next four years we can get our negotiated number from 3% to 10. That's 7% jump. That's a big jump. Um, I don't know the answer of, hey, what's the magic number of negotiated hogs to make it right more transparent, more sustainable, cut out that volatility that we saw from 03 to 18. I don't know what the magic number is, but to me, 3% certainly doesn't feel near, whoops, near uh, enough. We have uh, a new packing plant that's going to open uh, sometime in 2019 in Eagle Grove, Iowa, Wright County. You heard Dr. Meyer talk about it, the Prestige family. Uh, they are committed 
to be in the open market every day. They have hogs that they grow in the Carolinas and they grow in the state of Iowa. They are committed to continue. That today, they are about one-third of the negotiated market. Today. Um, they are going to continue to do that. They want to keep their hogs in the open market because they have a uh, contract with their packer supplier in the Carolinas that's based off of a USDA market. They want to protect and preserve and continue to uh, be involved in that market. They, ten, or they told me, and I called yesterday just to make sure because I've, I've talked to them quite a bit, but things change. Their intention is to buy 15 to 20 percent open market hogs every day. So that is going to, and you saw the scatter plot. If you did not, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of hogs in, uh, in Iowa. There's a lot of packing plants in Iowa. That one is going to be in the north central part of Iowa. If you live in southeast Iowa or you live in western Illinois or you live in southern Minnesota or you live in west, eastern Nebraska, you're going to have a viable market to call into every day and get a negotiated price. They are going to be there every day. Um, Again, the biggest complaint I've heard from producers is, well, I can't get a negotiated market. Yes, you can. So that's all I have for you. Any questions, comments? Heidi, yes. Okay, so just for point of clarification about what constitutes the negotiated cost, if we're making the schedule for next week on Wednesday of this week, and we know that we need a spot load or two spot loads next week. Are those negotiated hogs if they are with a formula negotiated or only the day prior accounts negotiated hogs? Okay, so anything with a formula negotiated goes back into that 201. Let me get back to it. Uh, goes into that column right there. If it is, if you call Packer A and say, I've got a load of hogs for next week that's not on an agreement, you bid and quibble, he says, I'll give you 80 bucks, you say I want 81, you settle at 80.50. That's a negotiated spot load. Even if it's for next week. Correct. But it's and that goes in today's pricing. Okay. Yep. Today's pricing. Yep. Good question, though. Dave, it's up to 10 business days of the day of the negotiation. Uh, yes, 10 days, yes. Yep. Now this report, I believe this, go, it's slaughtered swine for prior day, goes back 14 days, I believe. Yep. Right? Yeah, I think it's 14, so. If you're, if you're negotiating, how far out can you use a negotiation? Well, that depends, Howard. How far, the question was how far out can you negotiate? Um, as of recent, in the Eastern Corn Belt, um, you could negotiate hogs for the next day. Back in the day, that was popular, right? The Packers negotiated hogs Monday for Tuesday's kill. Today, with all of the committed supply, these Packers know what their flow is going to be. They get reports from producers that tell them what they're going to have for a flow for the next six months, right? Depends on where we're at on a bot position, where the Packers are at. If you catch a guy that's short, yeah, you can. I, I believe about three weeks ago, actually, last week I sold hogs on Thursday for Thursday slaughter. But the opposite, what Heidi was talking about, how, how far out, can you go out two weeks? Or? Generally, two weeks is not a, no, they don't general. I have not negotiated hogs two weeks out because, A, Right? I don't know if I'm safe. I have to protect my customer. If the market's fallen, you're darn right. And I think it's going to continue. I, I'd go out three weeks if I, they'd let me, but they don't. Um, so generally, Howard, it's, it's I'm negotiating hogs week A for week B delivery. Pretty popular. Yep. Yep. Next week. So, Other questions? Again, thank you. Uh, thank Dr. Patience and the committee for inviting me. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And if you ever have questions, don't be afraid to call in. All right, thank you.